Does anybody remember last week's message? No? If I was to show you a picture of, of John the Baptist's head on a platter, would that bring, would that bring a memory? I, that was last week. I didn't, I didn't uh, duplicate that. Um, but that, that helps to set a context. So for this message uh, today, we're going we're gonna to go. We're heading into Jesus walking on the water. I don't know, Kathy, I don't know if you knew that was the text for the, uh, but that is, our, that is our text, though not the story that you, that you read, but we're going we're gonna to con- compare that. Um, but to set context for this story of Jesus walking on the water. And then there's, it's not just a story that Jesus walked on the water. You get that, right? When we leave this room, if every one of us says, wow, Jesus walked on the water, I think I believe he did. So what? If you walk out of this room and you think, you know what, nobody can walk on water, and Jesus didn't walk on water, and, and you know what, they explained miracles away. I mean, they were a far distance from, the, from, from where they had started, and maybe they were near the shore on the other side, and Jesus came, and it was still dark, and maybe he was just walking along the shore, and they thought he was walking on the water, but he was only walking on the shore. Well, that's a fine explanation, but look at the miracle then we would talk about. The miracle is that Peter, walking on the shore with Jesus, walking on the ground, sinks into the dirt. Sometimes our explanations of miracles create a whole another complexity. How did Peter, like did he, what he did, he must have walked on quicksand. Dave, Lewis, my mind just went. You ever walk on quicksand? Or where there could, where it could have been quicksand? I was walking with a friend of mine. Some of you guys know the name uh, uh, Daryl Harvey. And Daryl, you're probably never going to listen to this, but if, if, you, if you are, uh, thanks for introducing me to the backpack trip. I was walking along in the Perea Canyon with uh, Daryl Harvey. One time he's got a backpack on. I, he, was to, he was to my side. And we were like, just walking, like he was here, like we were right next to each other. We're just walking along, talking. Next thing I know, boom, he is down to his hip in quicksand. And I, I saw the Tarzan movies. <laughs> well, without thinking, I just I reached out my hand. He kept walking and pulled him right on out. But that was, that was kind of a cool experience. I wish that had happened to me, but it happened to him. <laughs> See, I was the one that pulled him up. It kind of like Jesus. What happened to Peter when he was sinking? He said, Jesus, save me. You know what? Of all the preparation this week and this morning, I never even planned on saying what I just said. You see, that's why these messages get so long. Setting context. Last week, we talked about the miraculous feeding of the, of the 5,000. And we contrasted it with this birthday party of the king of the Jews, Herod. You see, we have two banquets going on, so to speak. Different looking banquets, but we have one king of the Jews, Herod, and another king of the Jews, Jesus. They're both kind of throwing a party, but they start out completely different, and they end up completely different. And just reminding you, if those that were here last week or listened listen to the message online, you, you know, we, we put a picture of, of Herod and, and all, the, all the abundance on the table and all the, everything that they had and Herodias' daughter danced and, and, uh, and, and the whole thing that the king was so pleased at the expression of entertainment and dance that he said, whatever you want, you can have. And she prompted by her mother says I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter one party starts out with an abundance celebration joy and it's all fun games until somebody gets hurt now we got another party going on the party is huge 
5,000 men plus women and children. Some estimate that the, the women and children would double the men. So you got perhaps 15,000 people. And, and here's the party. We got 15,000 people. We got two fish and five small loaves. This party starts out with such an inadequacy. It starts with nothing. But what does it end with? It ends with 12 basketfuls of leftovers as a result of the miraculous work of this kind of banquet, this kind of party that Jesus brings. And then we also reminded ourselves, this is part of setting the context for today's, we remind ourselves that, that the miraculous feeding of the 5,000 was the first miraculous story that actually had a miracle happen in the hands of the disciples. All the other miracles Jesus had done, he had done, but this time he, he calls his disciples to participate. You see, it's getting late. The disciples come to Jesus and, and, and they say to Jesus, Jesus, it's getting late. Send the people away so that, so that they can go into the villages and towns and buy some food because it's getting late. And then Jesus says these words. You feed them. You don't have to send them away. You don't send them away hungry. You don't send them away empty handed. You feed them. That's, that's a significant part of the words of Christ. You're there. You're a disciple. You got all these thousands. You have nothing except you found some kid with a lunch. And Jesus tells you, you feed him. You, you, you feed him. And what's your answer to that? You know, I heard a story in the Bible one time. That's about your answer. You see, it's hard for you and I to relate to the whole idea that we are to do the work that we cannot do. We're to accomplish the mission of Christ and we don't have the ability, you don't have, I don't have the ability to accomplish the work of Christ, yet even though they didn't realize it, Jesus gave them the ability as they're passing out, as they're, as they're obeying him the multiplication of the fish and the bread is happening it's like I don't think all of a sudden just out of heaven boom watch out here comes the, the uh, my mind just went to the Berlin uh, what do they call it, the airlift or remember that you know the Berlin people were surrounded but years ago World War II type thing you know it's like uh, the, the airlift where all the provisions dropped out of the sky that's not what happened here it started with something small. And in the breaking of the bread, in the taking, the blessing, the breaking, and the giving, sacramental language, sacrament is Christ is present. Symbol is just, it points to. Ritual is just, it reminds us of. Sacrament is, he is present. And he uses sacramental language when he says, you disciples, you do the work I'm calling you to do because I am with you. Okay? That, and so they end up with an abundance. Now, how many disciples are there? Were there? Twelve. How many basketfuls left over? Twelve. I, I threw out a theory. What if there were 15 disciples? How many basketfuls would have been left over? Theologically, there have been 15. Because the point is this. There is an abundance available to every disciple. That includes you. Might not include me. That includes all of us. If, of course, we are disciples. I'm in this class on evangelism, and I don't want to go too far into it, but one of the challenges of the, of, the, of the course is this. Is there a difference between a Christian and a disciple? That was never a question in the early church. It's, it's become a question over time. Because 
in our way that we've designed theology and the way we've understood things, we, we evangelicals, we, we, we made Christianity a prayer that you pray at an altar. And then we made this sense in which if I confess my sins and I put my trust in Christ and I pray the prayer, Lord Jesus, forgive me a sinner, save me, done. Is there anything wrong with that? See, that's the complexity of the class. Because there's absolutely nothing wrong with that except the implication that becoming a Christian is done... Boom, bingo, you're in, who's next? No, 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 no. You see, discipleship, to become a disciple involves a commitment, a decision, a will to follow Jesus. You see, it's one thing to believe in Jesus, to believe the doctrines that we have been taught since Sunday school when we were children. It's one thing to believe all that and say, I'm a Christian because I believe all that. It's a whole other thing to be a Christian because I do what Jesus did. I say what Jesus said. I believe what Jesus believed. I've been on this quest of understanding what is faith. I'm on this two and a half year quest. I'm still on the quest. Here's the new word for me. I came across it in one of my readings. It's one thing to believe in Jesus. It's another thing to believe what Jesus believed. We think to be a Christian is to believe in Jesus. When in reality, to be a Christian is to believe what Jesus believed. To follow what Jesus followed. Do you see a difference in that? All of a sudden, I need this prayer that says, Oh God, help me, forgive me, enable me. But you know what? Tomorrow, I need to pray, Oh God, help me, forgive me, enable me. Because there are sins that we commit. Now, if you're still committing sins of rebellion and defiance against God, would you stop that? I'm not going to stop that then don't... Oh, i got to be careful how I say this. How many Christians call themselves Christians that really aren't reflections of Jesus? Now, as soon as I say that, which, raise your hand if you're a wonderful reflection of Jesus. Do you see the complexity of talking about this? Because as soon as you say, oh yeah, I'm the best example of Jesus we got in the room. As soon as I say that, I've reflected that I'm not... So then we think, well, I'm just the worst scum. There's nothing. I'm just lowly. I'm just, no, I'm just dirt, man. And then we think that makes me a good Christian because I'm very humble, meek, and lowly like Jesus was. Oh, we need to stay humble, meek, and lowly. But when did Jesus ever shrink back at anything? We ju- uh, we're just setting the context, right? We're not in the text yet. So don't start the clock on how long the sermon takes. We're not even in the sermon yet. <laughs> that was a joke, kind of. And I, Annette's probably going like, where is he at? Yeah, okay, we're still at the context, okay. Okay, the, the next one, it says that one party begins in, in, in death, in in. It begins in plenty, ends in death. The next party uh, begins with little and ends with abundant life. That's all, the, that's all the provision. We're going into the next story. I want to read it. And, and for your sake and for honor to the Lord, I know it's old-fashioned, but let's, if you're able, would you stand in honor to the reading of God's word? Jesus walks on the water. This is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, starting in verse 22. Immediately... He made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat 
was already a long distance from the land, battered by the winds, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage. I am, or it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter said, oh boy, what did I just do? I'm sorry. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand, took hold of him, and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were there in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. When they had crossed over, they came to, to land at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent word into all the surrounding district and brought to him all who were sick. And they implored him that they might just touch the fringe or the hem of his garment. And as many as touched it were cured. Aren't you glad for the wording of God's truth? God bless you. Lord, help me. Help me to preach and proclaim the truths you want, us to, you want us to own and experience through this. What's interesting is the disciples had gone to Jesus and told Jesus, hey, it's getting late, dismiss the crowd. Previous story. Jesus says, no, you feed them, you give them something to eat. And then after the feeding, they got the 12 baskets. As, as soon as that's over, now Jesus goes ahead and he, and he compels, he tells his disciples to go into the boat and he sends them on their way and then he dismisses the crowd and then he goes off to be alone. Now remember, he wanted to be alone earlier. He'd heard that John the Baptist had his head cut off. And so he went to withdraw to be alone, but there were so many people that came, he couldn't be alone. He had compassion on them. He met their need, and now that their need is met, he sends the disciples on their way. He sends the crowd out, and then finally, how late is it now? It was late before he fed them. Now, he, how long does it take to feed 5,000 plus women and children. And now it's, it's, you know, like, I don't know, let's guess what time of night we're talking about. 10 o'clock? 11 o'clock? 9 o'clock? How, how late was it? We don't know. It was, it was getting late in the evening. Now, I think it might have been earlier in the evening simply because the disciples were saying they need to go into the villages and buy food. Well, don't they close up back then at 6 o'clock or something? So, you know, I don't know what time the shops closed, but we got that whole thing to work with. But the idea is, is it's been a long day. Jesus is grieving his, you know, the prophet. He wants to get alone. He finally gets alone, and he's, and he's re cooping because he spends time with the Heavenly Father to grieve, to pray, to rest. Is there a message in that for any of us? When you're tired, how many of us spend all night in prayer when we're tired? You know, I have a confession to make. When I'm tired, I spend all night sleeping. That's what I do. If like, if like I stayed up all night and prayed, it seems like it, I would be tired the next day. That's no good. Because I need my energy. So I would prefer sleeping than praying so then I can have energy. I mean, that's how my mind works. Anybody with me? Well, Jesus was like backwards. He said, man, I'm tired. I'm going to spend all night in prayer so that I have strength. 
I think there's something for all of us in this. There's something for all of us in this. It seems to the degree that Jesus spent alone time, just him and the Father, to that degree he was enabled to do whatever. Okay. Now this is so interesting to me. You got the picture of the storm? This is so interesting to me. You see, the language that Je- that's used here in the text is Jesus forced them. He pushed them. Now, maybe he was sick and tired, and it's like, finally, I got a chance to be alone. You disciples, get on out there. You know, it could have it been some attitude, but the language is, it wasn't, su- it wasn't like he suggested that they go, why don't you guys, I'll walk around. You guys, you guys, no, no. He, it was like, he made them. He compelled them. He forced them. Now, what's interesting about this is, It's similar to the idea that when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him. And what did the Spirit do to Jesus? Put him into the wilderness, right? To be tempted. Now this is so strange to me because culturally speaking, we have the language here. It's like uh, that in the dark tumult of the angry sea that is the realm the chaos, the dark the emptiness, the scariness that's the realm of evil which messes us up a little bit you see Jesus just enabled his disciples to participate in a miraculous work of the feeding of the 5,000 They said, Jesus, send them away. Jesus says, no, you feed them. And then Jesus enables them to feed them. And they're they're thinking about, wow, this is something. I don't know what they were talking about in the boat. But don't you think one of them would have said, wasn't that something? Like, that was incredible. It's like, it seemed like every time I broke a piece of bread, I thought I had two halves. But I had two holes. And I, I, I did two. And, and then I, I, broke, I broke it again. And I, it's like, what did you, that, yeah, that happened to me too. Or, you know, it's like, I can't believe, you know, it's like, didn't they have some kind of a conversation? Whatever the conversation was, it probably had something to do with the highlight of what had just happened. And in the midst of the highlight of just happened, it's kind of like, remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus reveals himself with Moses and Elijah, and he takes Peter, James, and John up there with him, and then they go down the mountain, and what do they find there? Oh, his disciples can't even, can't even cast out an evil spirit out of a boy. And Jesus says, how long will I put up with you? You see, they're on a mountaintop experience, and, what, and from there comes this challenge. You see, that's a pattern. There's a pattern. Pastors usually resign on Mondays. They tell us, don't resign on Monday. Well, wait till Friday. Well, man, by the time Friday comes, you're really zooming in on the next worship service. Yeah, that's why you're not resigning. You see, because you get a highlight worship experience, and for some reason, for some reason, you're discouraged as a result sometimes. How many know I'm talking about? You have this great thing, and then all of a sudden the temptations come. Jesus forces them out into this place. And you get, you get this, this idea that everything, when we read verses 24 and 25, it's all about images of evil. For instance, they, they had already gone a long distance from the safe shore. You see, they're a distance away from security. The more they get from security, the more dangerous it gets. You get that idea. And then you get the idea of the word battered. The word battered literally is tormented. They are being tormented. Now, when you think torment, what do you think? Jesus, we know who you are. Shut up. Have you come to torment us before our time? You know, what's the torment? It's like, you're going to destroy us. Don't destroy us. The thought of you destroying us, Jesus, torments us. Well, what brings them torment? The thought of potential destruction. They're, they're being tormented. The, the next one is the, 
the wind or the waves were, were contrary. The word contrary means adverse. Well, where did you get the idea of adverse? You ever hear of the adversary? Who's the adversary? Well, the worker of evil against our soul. So you got this dark, you got this distance, you got this torment, you got this adversary, and then you have this fourth watch of the night. Well, that's the darkest of the night. And so Jesus' opportunity to come is, is he comes, that's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. So he comes walking on the water in the midst of the realm of evil where they had just had this victory where God had done a miracle in their own hands. Jesus sends them out. Why did he do that? Why didn't he like let them rest and enjoy the work of their hands that he had done through them? Why did he all of a sudden send them into this work, labor, hard, feeling so. Just got a statement there. It just made sense that they thought that he was an evil manifestation. They thought that he was a ghost because they're in the realm of where the evil would show up. Now, what is Jesus doing coming on a scene where you would think evil is in charge? Jesus sends his disciples into evil on purpose after they've just done a wonderful thing. And then he comes and he says, boo. It's like, he's got a way. I, I just wonder, if God has a sense of humor, like I would, like he's given me, so I, I would think that, but I mean, if I was Jesus, I would probably be thinking something like, oh boy, I'm going to sneak. <laughs> I got I to gotta tiptoe because this, you know, I don't want them to, I don't want to, I don't want to hear me. It's like, <laughs> what does Jesus think they're going to think? I think he's got, he's got, Father, let's just have a little fun, okay? <laughs> let's, just, let's just do it. <laughs> you know, they are in an evil place, so um, anyway. But when they think he's a ghost, this is so important. The first thing Jesus says, by the way, says immediately. He doesn't mind how long they've been toiling all night long. He doesn't even mind that he put them in this tough situation. Doesn't it frustrate you a little bit that sometimes God is okay with putting you in a tough situation? How many have ever been found in a tough situation and when you ponder it, you go, God has me here. I'm the only one. Okay, I got, hey, thank you. Okay, we got a couple others. Yes. Had a Zoom call with some pastors talking about um, the way we do classes now for teaching others and all that kind of stuff. But one of the pastors said, you know, this COVID, I've never been more depressed in my whole life long. He says, I, I am, a, he, you know, he's an out, outgoing kind of a guy. He's ex, ex, uh, what you, what, extrovert. Uh, thank you. But you know what? There's like, we, we kind of, as a group of pastors, we kind of like sharing like, yeah, because this is weird. Church isn't the same. It's, we're not doing, it's like, and that could be, and that could be a good thing, it could be a bad thing, but, but there's this, there's this reality of, of there's a weightiness, and, and so many people are carrying a weightiness. Some of the, some of the, our elderly loved ones, and in fact, I talked a little bit with uh, Bonnie Walfo, with John, John's mom passed, they, her funeral was, uh, was uh, yesterday, and now John and Bonnie are uh, actually, uh, heading to Florida for some vacation but, but part of the theory was in her decline even though she was just shy of 95 years old part of the theory of her decline was she had been socially isolated nobody could really go and see her something happens to us when we get socially isolated and uh, a number of you listening online I mean, you, you're just, you just have to remain that way and, and we're asking God's presence and God's grace and encouragement upon you. But immediately when they were fearful, Jesus said I am. Where, where does that language I am come? It said, you know, it's translated it is I, but it literally is I am. It's, it's it, yeah, Moses, God, it's God. I'm God. I'm God in your midst. No matter how evil, no matter how scary, no matter how tormented, no matter how much the adversary of your soul is at work, let me tell you something, I am. So take courage. Do not be afraid. I am is in your midst. I am God in your midst. And then 
Peter had learned something. What did Peter learn? Oh, man, just last night, he did a miracle in my hands. And so, Lord, if it's you, I know you can do something. Tell me to walk on the water with you. He learned something. You see, he was among those that said, Lord, send them away. And then when Jesus said, you feed them, he was probably among those that said, ah, how can I do that? But now, having had that other experience, and now he sees Jesus, he's afraid, thinks Jesus is a ghost. But Jesus says, it's me. And he says, bid me to come. And then Jesus says, come. Put yourself in that situation. You know, it's so hard to like, you know, you're in a storm and, you know, Jesus walking on the water. It's hard to relate to that. It's hard to relate to all that. You know, the idea of come and walk on the water. How many, how many of you like, you're out there on your boat, out, out on uh, Lake Erie or something. You say, hey, look, watch this. And you, you dangle your foot over the edge. You say, watch me, I'm going to walk on the water. Oh, gotcha. You know, it's like all, all kinds of weird things. I saw a picture online of somebody walking right next to the shore. You know, but they got this picture, like their, their foot is just like ankle deep, and then the next foot is like right on top of the water, and the way they did the angle, they were just like, wow, that person's walking on water. You see, you know, like if, if, you, if you pull me at about 30 miles an hour, and you put a couple boards on my feet, I can walk on water. Mm-hmm. But it's hard for us to relate to that. Can I put a scenario out there? You're going about your business. You decide to take out your, you take out your girlfriend to American table because it's cheap. <laughs> and while you and your girl are sitting there, we can talk about her because she's like on vacation, right? <laughs> You're sitting there and you're a graduate now. You got extra money because you just had your party. <laughs> you say, hey, babe, anything you want. I'll take care of it. And then while, while you're, like, impressing your girl, somebody walks in the door and, you know, let's, let's, let's put them in a walker. Okay, let's put them in a walker. And then you get the sense of the Lord where he says, Josh, I want you to go and heal that person. I know we're not in a boat and the storm isn't going and Jesus isn't walking on water and he didn't, call, he didn't tell us to come. But in this situation, is it more possible? Do you see that person? Do you see that person? Do you, how many have seen that person, had a thought to engage, and then all of a sudden you said, la, 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 oh Jesus, do your work in me, but don't call me to do that, call me to do something else, because I don't want to do that right now, because I don't know what to do, and I can't do it anyway, so... And then you get home, you go, dear Lord, forgive me, help me to do it right next time. How many are with me? Does Jesus still show up in our lives? Does Jesus still respond to Lord, use me? Well, quit praying that prayer. Don't say, Lord, use me. But of course, all disciples say, Lord, use me. Are you a disciple of Jesus or just a mere Christian that's prayed a prayer? Are you looking for your free ticket to heaven or have you committed yourself to pick up your cross daily and follow him? Friends, okay. I think Peter learned something because of the previous story. He wanted to send people away unfed. But this time, Peter saying, Lord, maybe you could do this. And of course, seeing the wind. When was the last time you saw the wind? 
And this is interesting. Do you see the wind? When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, you know, in John chapter 3, you know, about being born again, Jesus says, it's like the wind. You don't see it. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's going. But here, Peter is walking on the water toward Jesus and he sees the unseen. He sees what you can't see, the wind. I wonder what this is about. Well, obviously it's this. He took his eyes off of Christ. He got, him, he got himself a good dose of reality that says, what am I doing? I'm walking on water. I can't walk on water. Are you kidding me? Something like that. Hospice George has passed. And um, I thank God for Hospice George. And by the grace of God, I believe he's with the Lord right now. But I think George did more for me than I ever did for him. I told you the story about the first time I called him. He like said every sailor thing he could say in the book about what, oh, your pastor, oh yeah, well let me tell you about God, rah, 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 rah. And uh, it's like I was feeling about this big about God. And, and you know, in my head, I'm going, in my head, I don't give a rip about you in some sense. You know, if you're going to talk to me this way, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to chart decline spiritual care. <laughs> Done. I'm done with you. I wasn't really, I don't really think that way, but I could have. I, my mind was thinking, I think this guy is going to decline spiritual care services. It doesn't sound good right now. So I'm kind of thinking in my head, all right, well, this, I'm about done here as soon as we hang up. But something happened in my head. I don't know what happened. It's just out of my mouth came. Oh, well, you sound like just the kind of guy I'd like to meet. And he goes, what did you say? Just like that. That's exactly how he said it. I mean, after he just called me every name in the book, it's like, what did you say? And I, and that's why I repeated And I said it just like this. I said, you sound like just the kind of guy I'd like to meet. And he says, are you in the area? I said, I'm right down the street. He says, come on over. That's how that started. It started with my mind thinking, I'm done with this guy, to, you sound like just the kind of guy I'd like to meet, to, come on over. I intentionally didn't talk about God that day. I just sat there in his bedroom and just, he just, he basically did about the same thing he did on the phone just for an hour. And when it, when it seemed like I had about enough, I said, George, do you mind if I come back again next month? <laughs> I like to get mistreated. <laughs> Came back. In fact, before I even was scheduled to go back, he had called our office and asked, hey, can you send that, can you send that minister over? And that second time, we had more of a conversation of getting to know each other, where he's from, background, all that kind of stuff. He had, had some cool stories, but at the end is what I remember. So, George, can I pray for you? He said, I guess. Something like that. He said, go ahead, if that's what you want to do. It was like, it was one of those kind of whatever, whatever kind of things. And I, I started to bow my head. And the Lord put in my head, no, take his hand and tell him to look you in the eyes. That was a, a clear as a bell. So I, you know, he's laying on his bed. I'm leaning over his bed. I take his hand. I said, George, look me in the eyes. And as, as soon, now, now we're, we're, we're eye to eye. And I just start saying things like, you need to know that God loves you as much as he loves me or anybody else and that you are a son of God and he gave his life. And I just started like just rattling off, just right off the top of my head. And, and this, old, this old soldier is doing one of these numbers. And then I said a prayer over him and and then at the end of that prayer his wife's in the other room. He goes, my wife's in the other room. She needs this too. Go pray for her. Okay, so I don't know what, you know, that kind of thing. But then as you know the story, I went back the third time, the third time when it was time to pray. He said, before you pray, let me tell you something. Do you remember last time? I said, yeah, I remember last time. He said, I don't know what you did. I felt this electric from the top of my head. He told me that. 
And I, I didn't feel a thing. I was as dead as a doornail in the sense of like, I didn't feel a thing. But I tell you what, if he sensed something powerful of God, and I just told him, I said, George, this, God's telling you that he's with you and he and he's, cares about you, you know, all, all good things. Every time I saw him, I affirmed, are you still talking to God? Are you still with God? Yeah, yeah. And I remember, I, I think I've shared this story, that his song that he wanted me to, to know about was the Chris Christopherson version of Why Me, Lord. And go ahead and listen to that. But it, it's a wonderful song. So it's like, this is, this is cool. But my point is this. If you say, I need you to go put your hands on somebody and have them feel an electric shock that transforms their life, I'm going to say, I can't do that. But I can hear when God says, pray for this person. Look him in the eyes. I can hear that. I mean, I understand that. Take his hand, look him in the eyes. I, okay, I can do that. And Jesus didn't inform me of everything that he was going to do. He just said, pray for him, take him by the hand, look him in the eyes. I didn't even know what I was going to say. It just came out my mouth. You know, I've got some, you know, it's not one brand new stuff to me. So I think there's something in there. My point is this. I think I've come to a place where Peter was. I hope you're there. Where, where you say when that restaurant situation or you see that person or wherever it is at work or at home, when you get that sense, come. I think I've come to a place where I'm willing to, I'm willing to make that step. And when we, the church of Jesus Christ, find it commonplace to go ahead and follow the prompts of the Lord then the church of Jesus Christ is alive and well and powerful. Now, I think we discern the voice of the Lord to the relationship that we're connected with him in the word, in worship, and in prayer. You realize that you just coming to church on a regular basis is in and of itself shaping your life whether you realize it or not. When you skip church, you're skipping part of the work of God. Yeah, but I don't get anything out of it. Well, it's just like you went to school for 12 years and got nothing out of it. You are getting more by being in worship than you realize. We are being shaped in ways we don't know. That's the importance of regular systematic. Okay, so Jesus pulls him out, and then he says this, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why do you doubt? Why do we doubt? What brings us doubt in our life? Whatever it is that brings us doubt, the central truth is this. When Christ is worshipped, when God is exalted, when we are praising him, when our focus is lifted on him and him alone, we got all kinds of power. When we're looking at the wind, here's what I perceive looking at the wind is. We're looking at the way life is going, We really don't know what's going on, but we decide it's negative. We pretty much convince ourselves that it's bad. Ooh, it's bad. What's the future of this local church? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm encouraged that you're here. It's better. I mean, attendance is pretty strong today. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) You ever had times in your life where you wondered what's going to go on? You're like, what's, what's happening? Ever have any questions like that? Anytime you ask what's happening, it's never like, wow, what's happening? This is great. It's usually, what's happening, man? Things are falling apart. This, this isn't good. Like my pastor friend said, uh, you know, he said, I've never been more discouraged in all my life. Depressed, he said. I've never been more depressed in all my life. Well, God doesn't bring depression. God brings hope, encouragement. Don't feel guilty. Verse 32, when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. Look at that. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what you want? Okay, I got to, I think I got to quit, but there's so much more I want to do. Do you remember the first story where Jesus was sleeping in the boat that Kathy had referenced earlier? 
they cried out to Jesus, Lord, don't you care? We're going to die. Jesus wakes up from a place of rest, rebukes the wind and waves, and it calms down. And the, and the announcement of the disciples was, who is this? Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Okay, that was back in chapter 8 or 9. Now we're in chapter 14. They get another similar story. This time Jesus isn't sleeping in the boat. He doesn't get any sleep. They wake him up. He stayed on the mountain and he said, I'll, I'll come to them when I'm good and ready. I mean, that's an interesting thing. Like Jesus learned something too. All right, when they get, when they get all shook up in the storms, they're going to wake me up when I need some rest. So I'm going to go get my rest and I'll come to them when I'm ready. They'll be okay. And we will be okay. And Jesus will come to us at the right time. But this time, they said, surely, this is the Son of God. Isn't that interesting? Who is this? This is God. They grew they had experienced that God had used them, a miracle, in and through their hands. So much so that even Peter, now the others didn't see it, but, or didn't participate apparently, but Peter at least walked on the water for a little while. I mean, let's not get too hard on him. It's like he stepped out because he, he just learned last night, God can use me, and if he can use me, then he can help me. And he did, I can't believe this, and then he sank. But now they get this other, the next story. It's, a, it's the image of, uh, of the, the you, see the, you see this is the woman. You remember the story of the woman? This is back in chapter 8 and 9 too. That the woman had come to Jesus. You see, Jer, uh, there was a, the, a person had come that his little daughter had died. And, and come, will you come heal her? So Jesus is on the way to take care of the daughter. In the meantime, this woman who's got this 12-year problem, she presses through. She touches the hem of his garment. Jesus feels virtue come from him. It's like, you know, when, when it, I don't feel anything, but Jesus must have, he's got the discernment. Well, I, don't, don't go into that. But basically, uh, here's this woman, and she gets her healing because she touches just the hem of his, she didn't touch him. She just touched the hem of his garment, the fringe. And Jesus felt the virtue go, and then he says, who touched me? And they all go, what are you talking about? Everybody's touching you, but not everybody's receiving what that woman received. There was something about just being able to touch the mere fringe. Do you realize that Jesus doesn't have to physically touch you? You can just get near his clothes. I don't know what that means. What it means is as we draw near to him, just on the edges even, there's power. Now, What's interesting is now they land, they're back in the boat, okay, they celebrate that, they're at Gennesaret, people hear word, and then they start, then they call her, hey, everybody who's got a problem, everyone's got a need, come, Jesus is, Jesus is in town, Jesus is in town. So they, they bring him out, and then all they want to do is what? Touch the fringe of his garment. Okay, so we've gone several chapters from the time the woman touched the fringe of the garment. And now, now, now these people, after this other, these other stories, this kind of the whole section of this scripture. Now he's going to go into another section next week in chapter 15. But this whole section kind of begins with the story of a woman touching the hem of his garment. Ends with a bunch of people coming to touch the hems of his garment. It starts with one, it ends with a bunch. Now, where is Jesus now? Do you see him? I don't see him physically. Do you see his clothing? No. Well, then what's the point? We could never touch the hem of his garment. The point is this. If you and I would just get close to him, that's all we need. All we need, my friends, is to be close to him. 
And as you and I are close to him, he does his work. He does his work. Jesus, we ask you to be close to us. The whole gospel story is that God came to us and your presence in us changes everything. And you allow us to participate in your work and your mission. One of the things, Lord, I want to pray for is this. Would you forgive us for looking at our faith as a set of propositions we have to accept so that someday we get to go to heaven. Forgive us, Lord, for that. We renounce that even though there's truth in it. We pray, Lord God, that you would so come close, so infill your church, just like when we take the sacrament of communion, would you so be present in us that we are your church, we are your garments, we are the light and salt of this world because you are radiating and shining in us. Lord, cause us to be with you. So give us an ability, even though we can't always be faithful, we pray that you would birth within us a commitment. It's an old, ancient word we don't hear much anymore. Lord, would you renew a resolve and a commitment that we are going to follow Jesus. We are going to be disciples. And then we will do what you tell us to do. So Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see as you lead us and as you guide us, we pray. Bring glory to yourself. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. May the Lord bless you. May he cause you to prosper richly in every good spiritual gift that there is in Jesus Christ. May he watch over you, guard and protect you and all whom you love. May his countenance, may his countenance be upon you. His face turn toward you such that you would see in Jesus how very much he loves you and accepts you right where you are and invites you to follow him. May he be gracious unto you. May you sense his favor, his mercy, his goodness as you walk with him. And may the Lord grant you peace. May you be at rest and centered in Jesus, who is our Lord and through whom we ask all of these things. Amen. Amen. God bless.